This past week, I uh, listened to a podcast in which the, uh, the speaker noted that 2020 opened a bit like 1972 with an impeachment crisis. And then it moved uh, back to 1918 with the global pandemic. And then it moved a bit ahead to 1928 with economic upheaval. Uh, and more recently, it has moved to 1968 with urban unrest. Uh, and of course, <laughs> we're only five months through the year and uh, I have not talked about the um, locust swarm the size of Manhattan that is decimating Africa. I haven't talked about projections on the hurricanes. I haven't talked about unemployment, which is remarkably down. I haven't talked about China, upcoming presidential election. But none of those things actually matter because almost everything was pushed off the front page of the paper, including COVID, which um, now feels like, you know, yesterday's news, even though it's not. But... Everything was pushed off the front page of the paper following the release of a video of George Floyd suffocating under the knee of a white Minneapolis police officer. In response to the video, and just to be clear, in response to other videos and other deaths, Samad Abri in, uh, in South Georgia, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Philando Castile in St. Paul, uh, there have been demonstrations, some peaceful, some not peaceful, that have taken place across the US and indeed around the world, in Germany, the UK, Canada, New Zealand, and the like. So Charles Spurgeon and Billy Graham are among those who reportedly said a pastor should preach with the Bible in one hand and today's newspaper in the other. Um, I don't generally do that, uh, in part because I don't always trust what I read in the paper but also because I'm just not that good. I'm not that fast. I need time to think. I need time to reflect, to pray, to study. Um, and so I, I want to process, especially if I feel unsettled. And, and when I heard about this video, I was, oh, no, you've got to be kidding. And uh, it was like, not again. And then when I tried to watch it, um, I, I was, again, upended. Um, I found it ultimately unwatchable. So for those reasons, I have decided to put aside what I was going to preach on and to talk about the events of the last two weeks. Now, just to be clear, I was going to preach on Romans 12.10, which I am going to preach on. Uh, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. My plan was to talk about this passage and, and then to explain how we were going to think about some of the things that we were going to do as it relates to opening the church over the course of the summer. It's a fluid situation. I, I'm, I'm not going to comment on any of that now. I'll record a video uh, soon and send that out to you with updates. I now want to look at this passage, but I want to do so from the context of more recent events. I was thinking about switching to Micah 6, 8. This is a very famous passage. Micah is a prophet and he says, uh, he asks, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. I also thought about uh, preaching on Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Daniel 9 is a passage in which uh, Daniel uh, confesses or sort of owns the, the sin of his people, of his culture, of his race, of his nation, of, his, of their past and their present. Uh, Daniel's unique in that of virtually uh, all the major characters in the Bible, with the exception of Jesus and Daniel, we see their sin. We see their problems. But uh, Daniel is the exception. We don't see any sin in his life, and yet he very famously leads his people and personally prays this prayer of repentance. So I was thinking about that, but I decided I was going to go with Romans. And um, this is Paul's magnum opus. Uh, it's his longest letter, and in some ways it's his richest letter. It's, his, it's, his, it's filled with deep theological truths. I've not attempted to preach through the book of Romans because it took me five years to get through the book of Acts. It took me two years to get through Philippians. I, I figured I would never get out of Romans. 
Uh, I'm just not up for that. But uh, it's not just deep, it's also practical. Like a lot of Paul's letters, it starts with theory and then it moves to practice. It starts with deep theological insights and then it moves to application. And uh, here in uh, Romans 12, 9, it says, Be sincere in your love for others. Hate everything that is evil. Hold tight to everything that is good. Love each other as brothers and sisters. And honor others more than you do yourself. So rather than reinforce our desire to get our way or to get ahead, rather than suggest that we demand our rights, or protect what is ours, rather than reinforcing our fallen nature and sounding like uh, Nietzsche or Ayn Rand, Paul calls on us to focus on others, to put the needs of others ahead of our own needs. The key word is love. It gets repeated. Um, We're also told to hate evil, but my focus is on this idea of honoring others. Uh, I want us to see that one of the underlying themes of not just of this passage, but of the Bible is that we are to become like Christ, right? That, that our character is more important than our comfort. And, and that part of becoming like Christ means that we begin to focus on the needs and the concerns of others, especially the poor and the oppressed. Now, Focusing on the needs of others does not mean necessarily that we give them whatever they want. Parents have figured this out. We cannot uh, do that. But um, this is not all that Jesus says about this topic. It's not all that Jesus uh, teaches on this topic. He calls on us to be humble. He calls on us to care for our neighbors. He calls on us to love our enemies. He calls on us not simply to not do to others what we don't want them to do to us, the silver rule, but to do the golden rule, to do unto others what we wish they would do unto us. So I want to unpack the idea today that, that Christ Church, that you uh, and me, should be focused on the well-being of others and to think about that in light of what is going on right now. Now, as I jump in, um, I need to say some things about what I'm going to say. Uh, I want to qualify them. For starters, I want to say that uh, I will get some things wrong. Let me apologize right now uh, in advance for saying that um, the situation is fluid. I'm not even trying to stay current on what's going on. Uh, I'm trying to limit my social media and limit my intake on the news. I'm not trying to stay current. And I am obviously going to see things through my own perspective, my own biases and limitations. So I will get some things wrong. I apologize for that. Second, I want to say that I'm going to approach these things as a white male, which is how God made me. I'm not apologizing for being a white male, but I do recognize that it's limiting. Now, in one sense, every perspective is limiting. But in another sense, being a white male in this culture is particularly limiting because it's sort of set up for white males. And so uh, there are advantages that I enjoy that are invisible to me. Third, I want to say I approach this topic with the view that it is complex. I am not going to focus on the Floyd case, in part because um, I know very little about it, in part because the circumstances are fluid. I expect over the coming weeks to hear more about the background of Floyd, to hear more about the background of the police officer. I expect all those things to happen. I I don't want to talk about that case, in part because it, it doesn't matter. The issue is bigger than any one case. I don't want to talk uh, about police officers that are bad because uh, I know that there are bad police officers among the 800,000 police officers in this country. I also know that the people who hate bad police officers more than anyone are good police officers and that most police officers are good and they're, they're serving and they're putting themselves in harm's way. They're doing difficult, complex jobs. Uh, so I, I, wanna, I want to not discredit the work of the police because of some bad police officers, but I want to say, yes, we have problems with policing. In a similar way, by the way, I, I don't want to talk about the protests that have gotten out of hand. 
and, and, and these protests that have turned into rioting and looting because uh, I don't believe it's fair to blame all the demonstrators for the violence that is being committed by a few. Of course the looting is bad. Of course the looting is criminal. It's destructive. It makes a bad situation worse. It needs to be stopped. But this doesn't mean protesting is bad. Sherry and I were at a peaceful protest this week in Waukegan. I am a Protestant pastor. Protestant means protester. <laughs> we were protesting. Protestants were protesting against what they saw to be the abuses in the church. And one of the things that I did this week was listen to some of the speeches by uh, Martin Luther King um, in which he called for nonviolent protests. It was brilliant moral leadership. Uh, he, he argued that there needed to be protests against segregation, against Jim Crow laws, against these things that were unjust. He called for nonviolent protests. Protesting is not bad. So I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I want to say it's complicated. Fourth thing that I want to say is um, not if I make you mad, but I expect to make you mad. Now, just for the record, uh, it's not my goal, uh, but not making you mad is also not my goal. I long stopped running for homecoming king. I, 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 whether you like me or don't like me is something I, I can't focus on. So I expect some of you to think that I say too much and some of you to think I say too little. But I do want to say, if I make you mad, when I make you mad, let me know. So normally when I'm preaching a sermon that I think is controversial, I'll say something like, hey, if you've got a problems with what I'm saying, um, please uh, write to the campus pastor and tell them all about it. In other words, I, you know, I don't send me any emails. This time I want to say, um, send me an email. As a matter of fact, here's my email. And I think today we need more dialogue, not less dialogue about what's going on. So if you think I'm missing something, please send me an email and let me know. The last qualification I'll say is that I believe Christ Church has done some good work to address issues of justice and racism, but not enough. We have uh, ongoing multi-ethnic gatherings that meet to talk about uh, racial issues and racial tension and racial understanding. Alex Chu, uh, our local missions pastor, led one of these a while back. I have been in these discussions. I've occasionally preached on race. Uh, we made helping uh, under-resourced community north of us, North Chicago, uh, many of whom are people of color, our biggest area of focus. So lots of listening, lots of serving, lots of joint services with churches there. I spend lots of time with pastors in North Chicago and in Waukegan, have learned a lot from them. Uh, over the last few years, we have, we have uh, committed a million dollars and most of the 100,000 service hours that we have been working on as part of the REACH campaign has been directed in that direction. Uh, we started a justice center. We have done some good things, but uh, I do not believe that we have done enough. So what I want to do, uh, ultimately, is, is make a proposal to you, and I want to then frame the, the mindset that I want to encourage you to have. But before that, I want to set before you six assumptions that I have that I believe you share, but that I want to state just because I'm building my assumption, I'm building my proposal on these assumptions, so I want to list them. The first one is that racism is evil. We share a common bond as people made in the image of God. And uh, we are equally loved by him. And what unites us, our common identity made in, in the Imago Dei, that is so much greater than what separates us. Consequently, when we think we are better, <clears throat> smarter, more valuable, better in any way, than someone else because of their ethnicity, because of their race. We are sinful. Racism is evil. And by the way, I not only think it's evil, I think it's wrong. <clears throat> um, now, while I'm here, let me just unpack this a little bit. I do believe that there are cultures that are better at some things than other cultures. Now, uh, Culture's a mixed bag. 
Uh, ethnicity is not. Ethnicity, culture is our way of life. It, it refers to things handed down to us by our parents, food, clothing, music, and more, often a worldview, a set of beliefs about how to live. Ethnicity speaks to God creating us in a certain way. And ethnicity goes beyond black and white and brown and red. Ethnicity is God-given and it's always good. Some cultures, not ethnicities, some cultures are better than others in certain things. This is not a politically correct statement, but I believe it's certainly true. So let me just say, um, uh, I think Western culture, of which I am a part, white Western culture in particular, is pretty good at generating wealth. <laughs> By that, I don't mean it's the best culture. The Bible has a lot of scary things to say about generating wealth. So I don't believe that it's the best culture, but I believe that it's good in those areas. And I believe that those cultures that advance biblical ideals are better than those cultures that don't. So let me give you an example. I believe that cultures that, that kill uh, baby girls because they view them as worthless or that circumcise young women because that's part of their rite of passage or those cultures that worship idols or denigrate the institution of marriage. I believe those cultures are bad cultures in those points and that they are not as good as cultures that, that promote, uh, promote the value of women, that promote the value of marriage. Now, <clears throat> this is tricky stuff. There are lots of ways to get it wrong and very few ways to get it right. So let me say, racism is evil. Ethnicity is good. Culture is a mixed bag. Racism is evil. It's evil not just in America, it's evil around the world. America has its own particular challenges here growing out of nearly 250 years of slavery. In some ways, things are getting better. In many ways, we're stuck. And in some ways, perhaps things are worse. Number two, the problems are bigger than you think. By this, I mean something specific. The problems we are facing now are systemic, which is hard for Western people in general to see, and it's uniquely hard for Americans to see, white Americans to see. We tend to think in very individualistic terms, but in order to understand the Bible, in order to understand the gospel, and in order to understand what's going on, we have to think outside of individualistic terms. Now, I need an hour to develop these points, and I don't have an hour, but I'm, I, I want to just set a few passages in front of you to get your attention. These are passages that if you've been at church for any length of time and you've heard, you didn't like. Joshua 7, Daniel 9. Romans 5. So in Joshua 7, Achan uh, and his family are put to death. Uh, Achan and his family are, uh, are Jews. They're part of the, the group that is going in to conquer the promised land. They've been specifically told they are not to take anything from the nations that they are defeating. Achan does. He hides it in his tent. It's a big problem. When it's discovered, Achan and his family are all punished. And when you read this, you think, why was Achan's family punished? This is what Achan did, okay? Second passage, not completely unlike this. I have already referenced Daniel chapter nine. Daniel, we see no sin in his life, but Daniel prays a prayer of confession in which he owns the guilt, the wrong uh, of his nation. It's, it's the Israelite nation, so it's a, it's a race, an ethnicity, it's a, it's a nation, it's a culture. He says, I am responsible for the things that have happened among my people because uh, that's the way it works. And then in Romans 5, we have a Paul writing, it's, we call this federal theology, and he, he writes about the fact that all of humanity has suffered the guilt, is responsible for the sin of Adam. In a like manner, we get to the gospel where, where we can all be redeemed and reconciled to God through the righteousness of Christ. So, so what's happening with one is being, is being expanded to others. So these things don't seem fair to us because our culture is fiercely individualistic. 
But many people in many places get it because their cultures are not so individualistic. And they know that, that we are not simply the product of our own choices, that we are the product of our systems. In Aiken's case, his family is culpable because his family somehow allows Aiken to become the kind of person that is going to steal. They either fostered that view or at the very least they didn't prevent it. And so uh, they are actively or passively also guilty. Most of us do not see that we're a part of a community that is shaping other people, but the Bible sees it that way. With Achan, it's his family. With Daniel, it's his culture and his nation. And with Paul, uh, it is all of humanity. The point being, we are part of broader systems and we are responsible. We have responsibility for what is happening in those systems. Now, we have varying levels of responsibility. And I think the easiest way to think about this is to think back to the Nazis in Germany. So there's a group of people at the top who decide on this final solution, right? We're gonna build extermination camps. We're gonna, we're gonna try and kill six, we're gonna try and wipe out the Jewish people, killing six million. Under them, these people obviously have the, the greatest responsibility and culpability. Under them, you have the guards that staffed these camps and saw what was going on. Under them, you have people in the community uh, outside, you know, the, the concentration camps in Auschwitz, outside of the community, and they undoubtedly knew some things. The civic leaders, I'm thinking, they, they knew some things, but they chose not to pursue what they knew. And then down further, you have people who maybe just heard rumors of what was going on, but don't ask questions. Uh, I think we would agree that there's varying levels of responsibility, but that the people throughout the system should have done something. In a similar way, um, I know a guy, retired pastor, and uh, he said, you know, 50 years ago when he was starting, he was in a small community, and it was about 25, 30% uh, men and women of color, and that they lived in the poor part of town. And he said, we had six councilmen or aldermen or wh whatever, six civic magistrates that got elected collectively by the people. And the argument was, we're, no one person is going to represent anyone. We're all going to represent everyone, and that's the way it's going to go. Well, that system set it up so that the poor did not have representation. And they were, uh, they consequently didn't have good resources, equal resources to others. And he said, at some point, I figured this out. He says, initially, I didn't get it. But at some point, I started to get it. And he said, I didn't say anything. And he said, to my regret, 50 years later, I look back. He goes, now it changed shortly after I left, but through no thanks of me. And he says, I had some responsibility for allowing that system to continue. A study was done, a uh, classic study was done of a car dealership. And they were trying to figure out, because this is back before CarMax and, you know, no, no dicker uh, sticker prices, no bicker sticker prices. Um, uh, in, in the study that was done was when there, you could negotiate for a, a car. And they were studying what kind of deals people got. And what they discovered in these studies was that uh, men got better deals than women and that whites got better deals than blacks. And so what they announced was that uh, white women were subsidizing the, the deals that, excuse me, black women were subsidizing the deals that white men were getting, which was clearly unfair. And now before it's announced that it's unfair, before the white male knows that this is what is happening, I don't see any culpability for uh, trying to get a good deal on a car. But once you know what's happening, then you say, well, this isn't right. I shouldn't be participating in this system. A few years ago, five years ago, they announced suddenly that, wow, these, uh, these clothes or these shoes, these sneakers are being made in sweatshops in you know, Vietnam or Cambodia or Indonesia. And people are being paid three cents a day or whatever it was. And, and once, I mean, before that, I'd never once thought about who made my shoes. 
But now suddenly it's like, oh my goodness, uh, I'm looking for the best deal I can get. What kind of system am I helping to perpetuate? So one of the challenges of today is that we, we live in, in a culture that is so big, we're often not aware of the advantages that we are reaping. But once we see them, and we need to see them, then we need to do what we can to be parts of correcting systems. So I have more stories, but uh, I, don't, I think you can see where I'm going. So some of the problems we have right now are systemic. Point number three, <clears throat> we have no choice but to reform. We cannot do nothing about racism in unjust systems. Yes, things have gotten better uh, over the last hundred years, but there remain real problems at the immediate time. And as Christ followers, we must fight injustice and care for the oppressed and do what we can to promote and preserve the dignity and worth of other people. Now, as an aside, I would, I would suggest that you want to do this, whoever you are, for your own well-being. I would suggest that we want societies in which people flourish because those societies are far more stable than unjust societies where there is great inequity. Secondly, I would suggest that we want to do this for the, the well-being of our own soul. I was reading Eugene Peterson this week. And he made a comment that when there, were, when there were race riots back in the 60s in Baltimore, everyone was worried about the city. He said, as I looked around, I was worried about what was happening in my heart. I was worried about the problems in society. Worried about how that society and those systems were shaping my soul. Now, just to be clear, I assume that if you have... Um, if you are white and you have, or if you're, if you're black or brown, if anybody, if you have mistreated somebody or if you've thought ill of someone because of the color of their skin, that you realize that that's wrong and as the Holy Spirit brings that to your mind, you would confess that as sin and want to be better. It's been a long time since I've been in any setting in which anyone was openly willing to admit to racist views. But what I'm suggesting is that this problem is bigger than that and we have to go after and fix it. Point number four, violence is wrong. The destruction of life and property launched in response to the killing of Floyd is wrong. It is undermining other people. It's making the lives worse for many. And I would argue that uh, Dr. King was right in which he said it ultimately uh, doesn't work. Violent protests lead to backlash. He wanted and argued for nonviolent disobedience. Now, some counter that Jesus engaged in violence. Uh, they're un certainly thinking about uh, uh, Jesus overturning the, the money changers' tables in the temple and using a whip to drive out the animals. So just for the record, uh, he didn't use the whip on people, and he was going right after the problem. It was the money changers' tables he was up upturning that were the problem. It wasn't something else. <clears throat> violence is not a path forward. We don't get a pass for arson or looting because we're mad. Again, I would point everyone to the leadership of Dr. King. Number five, the church needs to step up. Washington and Springfield are not going to fix these problems. They don't have the answers, but Jesus has the answer. I believe that the institutions that we are depending upon across the board can only have a chance of succeeding if the church is growing and vibrant. I, I don't think government has a chance to, to help promote a flourishing society without growing Christ-like behavior out of people in the church. I don't think we can hire enough police officers to keep everything in line. I don't want to live in that kind of a world that even tries. I don't believe families have a chance of being all that they can be and should be and were designed to be without the church. But it, but it is only true that, the, that, that, that this will work if the church is true to her calling. In a wonderful statement that um, was issued this week, Tony Dungy, the um, Super Bowl winning coach, uh, current NFL uh, commentator, said, I believe uh, the solution has to start with those of us who claim to be Christians. 
We have to come to the forefront and demonstrate qualities of the one we claim to follow, Jesus Christ. We can't be silent. As Reverend Dr. King put it many years ago, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But we can't go forward with judgmental, bitter spirits. We need to be proactive, but do it in a spirit of trying to help make things better. And it can't just be the African-American churches. It has to be all churches taking a stand and saying, we are going to be on the forefront of meaningful dialogue and meaningful change. We have to be willing to speak the truth in love, but we have to recognize that we're not fighting against other people. We're fighting against Satan and his kingdom of spiritual darkness. In the words of the apostle Paul, Dungey says, do not be overcome by evil, but conquer evil by doing good. So what am I suggesting? Well, I've suggested so far that we are humble, that we focus on others. I've suggested that we repent, that we seek God's direction. I've suggested that we lament. We need to pray for leaders, for our leaders. We need to pray for leaders. We we could use an Abraham Lincoln or a Nelson Mandela about now. We need to be shaped by the gospel. I'm proposing a, a, a very simple idea. I want to suggest that as a church, we work collectively to promote equal justice under the law. This is not the only issue, but it is a contributing issue. And uh, I believe that we need a legal system that is colorblind. And I further believe, while I don't understand how complicated this would be, and I don't understand exactly what I'm calling us to, I know that we have civic leaders, we have attorneys, we have people who care deeply about justice. I think this is something we could take on and in our lifetime, either fix or make a demonstrable difference. To be clear, as I said, I don't know what this means, but you will hear more from me as I continue to pray about this and invite you to pray about this. And as we look around to figure some ways to get uh, our hands around some, some way we could make a difference. Secondly, I want to suggest, I want to suggest an attitude for you and that is captured in the the word plea, P-L-E-A. P, I want to suggest that you pray. Prayers of lament, prayers of confession, prayers asking wisdom for God to see your own life and to see how you can make a difference. Two, to listen. There's a whole lot of not listening going on out there right now. It's hard to listen to views you don't share. (laughs) But we need to do it. We need to learn, to listen. Three, engage. As a church, I'm suggesting some ways that collectively we'll engage. I'm suggesting that you engage personally, and I wanna suggest this first of all by by taking on some new reading. I I have recommended every year that I've been here, I've recommended that that people read uh, Martin Luther King's uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. You can get that online, it's free, it's a PDF. You could read it this afternoon. Uh, I am uh, also, I recommend the book Divided by Faith. Uh, It was very helpful to me 15 years ago, uh, illuminative to me. Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, another classic. Many of you haven't read it since high school. You don't realize it's a Christian book and that Uncle Tom is a Christ figure. There's much there. But I've been asking people this week who, who I believe think I don't get it to recommend things for me to read podcast to listen to. They've recommended some books. I've ordered them on Amazon. I want to suggest that you make it a priority to read some books that are going to help educate you, enlighten you. And I also want to recommend that you have friends that don't look like you. Uh, No one wants to be your project on this assignment, but uh, proximity leads to empathy. When you hear, if you're white and you hear the challenges being faced by the African-American family that you're blind to, it never occurred to you that you have to teach your son or daughter never to cut through somebody's yard because they could get caught in the backyard and, and be misunderstood. There's so many different things that we don't understand. I want to encourage you that proximity leads to empathy. Distance breeds suspicion. And then the A is to acknowledge, to repent where you're wrong, develop the ability to see things that are right. Look, we're not going to fix this this quickly. These are generational problems that we are facing right now. But we don't have any choice. (laughs) I mean, you might think that you've got a choice. I suppose you've got a choice to, to uh, continue down the same path, but I'm suggesting that, that as a Christ follower, we have got to pay attention 
to the needs of others. We are, we are to work to a society that embraces the values and care, especially for the poor and oppressed that Christ has put forward. This is what Romans 12 is calling us to. So I don't think we have a choice. And honestly, I'm hopeful, not always optimistic, and I hope I'm not being naive, but in Christ, I have hope. I can't promise an easy life this side of the grave to anyone. The prophets in the Bible didn't live to see the, the just societies that they were arguing for. But one day justice will reign. And, and I know that hope is the right path. We are called to hope and that hope is contagious. So I believe we will move through this just as we will move through COVID. Um, but it's going to take us a long time uh, of obedience in a similar direction. So I invite you to that path. Let me pray. Lord God, heal our land. May, may there be justice. May there be peace. May there be understanding. May there be listening. May your church serve in ways that are pleasing to you. Help us to see ourselves. Whoever we are, help us to see ourselves more clearly. Help us to see how we can be part of ways forward, uh, not not other ways. So guide us to that end. Bless Christ Church as we head down this path. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So it's possible that you are going to stop by one of the campuses, um, Lake Forest, uh, Crossroads or Vernon Hills campus today to celebrate communion and drive through communion. But um, if not, um, if that's not going to happen, I want to give you an opportunity to partake of the Lord's meal right now. And I say all of this in the context of uh, this being a great illustration or a confirmation of this point that I was making out of Romans chapter 5, that, that, um, that we're part of a community and indeed that, that what is happening to one can happen to all or it affects all. And so Romans 5 talks about sin entering the world through one person, but, but it is the gospel through Jesus Christ. It is, it is reconciliation that happens through Christ that can be shared by us. And, and it happens through his death in which he died in our place and then gives us his righteousness. When, when we come to faith in Christ, our guilt is transferred to him and his his holiness gets credited to our account. And we celebrate and remember the Lord's table um, to remind us of the death of Christ on our behalf. So what we're told is that on the night that he was betrayed, Christ took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and then he took some. I invite you prayerfully to partake of the bread. In a similar manner, after supper, Christ took the cup and he said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood, the new deal, forgiveness through the work, uh, the death of Jesus Christ. So this cup represents the covenant through Christ. Take and drink. The Apostle Paul adds, as often as we eat of this bread or drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death as the pivotal point of history until he returns.